Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. How many believe that your best days are ahead, honestly? Like you really believe that, like, man, my, my, my days are going to get better. And I know when you're heavy in spirit, um, it's hard to see things, but it's, it's, it's wonderful when you have people that have like faith that can look at you and say, you know what, Anusha, I can see life's going to get so much better for you. I can see God preparing you and developing you for the next season he has for you. And I know, I know that a lot of people don't like seasons because your season may suck right now. <laughs> but uh, like seasons, they, they change. You're probably in winter right now. Well, guess what? Summer's coming. It's going to be bright. It's going to be awesome. And so uh, you need other people to see the best in you when you see the worst in yourself. You need those kind of people. And, you know, last night... Um, it was one of those nights for me where I felt very heavy. And, uh, and you know, I'm always that guy that always prepares my message like a week before. And this whole week, of course, I was busy and stuff was happening. I'm just like, man, I feel like blank. And, uh, and on top of that, with a lot of other responsibilities I have, I just felt like, wow, man, God, I'm just overwhelmed. But it's pretty awesome when, when you're squeezed, something's going to come out. And hopefully it's Jesus again. And, um, and so last night as I was just feeling just overwhelmed, I decided to just play the word. There's something powerful about meditating on the word of God. There's something so powerful. You know, sometimes you're just too exhausted, too weary, too tired to read. Um, but, you can, but you can praise God for technology. You can play the word of God. And so I started playing the scriptures last night as I was laying in my bed and just like, okay, God. You know, I have a lot of word in me. That's not the issue. But I want a pinpoint word from heaven. And uh, as I was hearing the verses, um, I started listening to Psalms 23. And Psalms 23 is so powerful. It's so life-changing. So I, I heard it over and over and over and over and over. And all of a sudden, you know what, that word. And here's what the word does. When you begin to meditate on God's word, we say God's word. Uh, listen, you're meditating right now on something. You might as well meditate on something good. A lot of people are meditating on all kinds of stuff, fear, doubts, uh, unforgiveness, uh, retaliation, rebellion, whatever you're thinking of, but you have to make a personal decision to come back to the truth, and the truth is that God's word can set you free. So as I'm meditating on the word of God, and as you meditate on the word of God, that word begins to do spiritual surgery in your life. It will drive out any fear out of your life when you meditate on God's word. When you meditate on God's word, it will drive out doubt. It will drive out that mentality of lack, that, min, that mindset of I don't have enough, that mindset of I want to quit. It will literally drive all those toxic thoughts out of your life as you begin to chew and meditate on the word of God. Like that's what you have to do. So I started just meditating on Psalm 23 over and over and listening to it. And um, I was like, Man, I need to speak. I need to preach on this because you know what? Here's the truth. I have never preached ever off of one chapter, ever. Today's will be my first day. And I, I said to myself, I need to break this down. So I got up at 4 a.m. and I started just breaking down all of Psalm 23 into pieces. But let me give you some context here just so you understand because as I started studying and really looking at where David was in his life, what state he was in. Because when you read Psalm 23, we read it like this protection scripture and, and not understand the state of mind that David was in when this, this scripture was birthed. When, when someone began to write the account of what happened to David, uh, one of the greatest warriors that ever existed on planet earth. We're talking about a king, David, not just any David. And... Um, as I begin to just uh, study just a little bit more about the, 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 the backstory of Psalm 23, I begin to see that there is a, a, a uh, uh, be, between like four different theologians I read this morning, they were all arguing about what state he was in. And as I read everyone's kind of mindset of what they thought about Psalm 23, I realized this. I realized that when, when David began to 
go through this event. Uh, this was a moment in his life where his son, uh, Absalom, you guys remember his son, Absalom? His son, Absalom, reached a place of so much pride and so much arrogance that he thought to himself, I can do it better, better than my father. Now, mind you, David made a lot of mistakes in his life, so now he was bearing the fruit of his choices. Uh, I, 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 listen, I want you to remember this. When you're born, you're born and you look like your parents. But when you die, you look like your decisions. David made a lot of bad decisions. He had an adulterous affair. He murdered the, the husband of the woman he had an adulterous affair. His kids were uh, having incest relationships. It was just chaotic. So now, Dave, just so you understand, okay, theologians, um, and, and if you read the scriptures, when we read the book of Psalm, it's 150 chapters, right? And we think that chronologically, that's the order of what happened in David's life. It is not the chronological order. And so the argument was, Psalms 23 is the beginning. No, it's not. It was the end of his life. But as I kept reading, I realized that, no, this, is, this was the end of David's life. These were the last days of his life. And so it's not how you start. It's how will you finish this life? How are you going to finish? Some of you, you are in your fourth quarter of life. And you have an opportunity to finish strong and not let your past dictate who you are today. You see, when you begin to meditate on God's word, he, God will literally redefine your identity. And so many of us have been identifying with a divorce. We've been identifying with a hurt, a brokenness. We've been identifying with something that took place, an event that happened in your life. And you can't get past that event because now that's become who you are. But I love the story because the truth is that as I kept reading it and hearing it all night over and over and over and over and over, I realized that, you know what, David was literally, this was coming out of him on the last days of his life when he had made so many poor decisions. But when you make poor decisions, how many know that there's always restoration with God? There's always restoration for you. You're not too far. You're not too lost. You're not too broken. You're not too busted. You're not so down that God can't pick you up. God can pick you up. He just needs a man and a woman that will stand up and begin to declare the faithfulness of the Lord. Amen. Come on, give yourselves a big hand. You got this. So Absalom, his son, begins to chase David down. Absalom begins to divide his, his kingdom. He divides the nation of Israel. How do you divide a nation of Israel? Gossip, slander, and lies. That's how you, that's how you, that's how you divide people. That's why it's so dangerous. Whenever you hear anyone in this church or any person in this world or people you so when you always hear them say, I, 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 I did this and I did that and I and I be careful with those people because there is no I and we, but there is an I in sin. Amen? And so, and so Absalom began to say, I can do this. I can do that. And he begins to literally, he grabs David's leadership and he begins to divide them from David. And then he begins to go to the nation and he starts having speeches. I, I feel like I, and it was this I, I, I. And you know what? If you study out the scriptures, and, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm gonna, one day I'm going to do a whole s series on, on the spirit of Absalom. There is such thing as the spirit of Absalom. Absalom simply means division, divide, or separation. That's what that spirit does. And you have to remember that you can be one of those people that are that kind of person that do divide. And so you have to tell yourself, okay, I got to break that spirit of Absalom in my life. I'm not a divider. I'm a uniter. Amen? And so Absalom comes in and he starts dividing the church. He starts dividing his kingdom. He starts dividing the leadership. He's dividing everyone from David who was anointed and appointed to be king. And you know what's interesting is that if you're not careful, the very place that God delivered you from is the very place you can end up back in. You see, now David is running from an Absalom. His own son, he's running from him. But David still had a few good men that were faithful, loyal, committed. And they were telling David, we're with you, man. We're with you till you die. Once again, you have to really identify what kind of friends you have in your life. Because you're going to need them when you're at the worst place of your life. 
And when he was running from Absalom, a few good men ran with him into the woods. Now they're in the woods. They're deep in the woods. And David is in a place of like, I remember this. But see, something had to happen in that low place. Something had to happen in that season of destruction. You know why? Because David was used to running. Before he was ever king, who chased him? Saul. So David was running from Saul. And then, of course, God delivers him. David gets the spirit of boldness and courage. And he finally steps into his kingship, right? But now he lets life get in the way. All of a sudden, things that, that would not get to him spiritually, things that, that he said no way to, sins that he said never again, I'll never step into that again. Somehow, a little, a little, a little bit more of the, of, the, of the loaf of the bread was sliced, a little bit more integrity, a little bit more. And before you knew it, he's right back at running again. He went from fight to flight. Are you, are you hearing me today? You better get this today. Because some of you are taking flight from the palace that God called you to. And so now he's deep in the woods and he realizes, what am I doing? Have you ever asked yourself, and if you haven't, you will one day, how did I get this far? Or you'll say this, I can't believe I'm here. One day you will say that. If not, you may have already said that. You can come to a place in your life and say, how in the hell did I get to this place? This was not me. I'll tell you why. Because what you meditate on is so powerful that it will literally give you a whole new identity. So you better start chewing on the right stuff. And so in this moment, David is, is now birthing a Psalm 23. Are you all ready for this? Okay, let's move quickly because we got to get out of here, okay? Time just went on us, didn't it? All right, let's do this thing. So now he's deep in the woods, Psalm 23. You, let's all read this together. Let's all stand to our feet. Let's just, let's just come on. We're going to say, man, my life's going to change today. Say that with me. My life's going to change. Come on, say it. I'm getting out of this place. I'm getting that, whatever that issue is in my soul. Oh, no, say it. Don't get, don't get upset. Here, say it. Whatever that issue is in my soul, you're coming out. Sadness, depression, oppression, lack, you're leaving my life. In Jesus' name, I'm leaving changed, transformed, full of joy, and ready for the fight. In Jesus' name. Now give the Lord a hand clap. All right. Now let's all read this like actual warriors and not read it weak. And let's be in unison at the count of three. Ready? Let's all stare at the screens, whatever screen. Take your pick. Don't miss it like I did at the eight. Ready? One, two, three. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness. Amen. All right. Be seated now. So he starts with this. He's in the, he's in the, in the woods and, and he's being chased and, and you can just imagine this guy's running from his responsibility. He's the king and he's running. But he comes to a place in his life where he says, the Lord is my shepherd. You see right now there's either King you or there's King Jesus. Right now something or someone is leading you and it may not be the Lord. And so you have to come back and say, the Lord is my shepherd. Say with me, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord. See, David was reminding himself who is king in this situation. Who is king in your moment? Who is king in this season of your life? Who's the king? Is it king me or is it king Jesus? And he begins to remind himself, wait a minute, the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, man, the Lord's got my back. Man, the Lord is for me, not against me. 
Even if you have messed up, screwed up, guess what? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And he's reminding my, himself that he's not alone. He's reminding himself of the God of the cosmos, the God of the stars, the moon, the sun, the God of all the ocean, the God of heaven, and the God of earth where you and I live. He says, that is my shepherd. You see, I believe that so many times, if not careful, you know what we make our shepherd? We make money our shepherd. We make our jobs our shepherd. We make our, our talents, our gifting, our shepherd. We make our paycheck our shepherd. We make our jobs our shepherd. My paycheck is not my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Amen? I, and I think so many times we can also put this expectation on relationships, on people, and you make people your shepherd. Now, I get it. I'm the shepherd of this house, but I'm not the ultimate shepherd. So don't put me on a pedestal because this shepherd here will disappoint you. But that shepherd will never disappoint you, will never leave you, will never forsake you, and will always be with you. Amen? Amen. But you better be a good follower. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He says, he's my shepherd. He understood what it meant to be a shepherd. Why? Before he was king, he was a shepherd boy. And he knew that when the wolf came, he knew when the lion came, he knew when the bear came, that as a shepherd, he protected the sheep. As a shepherd, he not only protected the sheep, he guided the sheep. He directed the sheep. When you're at the lowest place in your life, meditate on God's word because that word will guide you, will lead you, will protect you, will redefine you, will heal you, will restore you. I'm telling you, get the revelation of the Lord is my shepherd. I love this. Is he your shepherd? It's a good question to ask yourself because many people are finding their hope in people. Well, when my wife changes, then I'll be better. No, you won't. You've always been crazy. Isn't it true we, that we put our faith in counterfeits? All of us do. Oh, once I, buy, once, once I buy my home, then I'll be happy. No, you won't. You're still depressed. You're in a brand new home and you're still jacked up. Oh, once, my, once I get my car, life will be better. No, it's not. Especially when the, the new smell goes away after six months. Because you've been in it. I'm just saying. Oh, when, when I get married, then I'll be happy now. No, you won't. Trust me. It'll be work. No, I'm just kidding. You'll be happy. It's work. Marriage is work. Family's work. Kids are work. <laughs> Did you see the eyes? Did you see her eyes? She just rolled them. Girl. <laughs> and here's the truth. He, he had to come to the place where he, he understood that his, even his own children failed him. Absalom, his own son, turned against him. See, your enemy is not your, your son. Your enemy is not your daughter. Your enemy is not your spouse. Your enemy is not your friends. Your enemy is Satan, and he hates you. But the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus says in John 10, 11, I'm the good shepherd, and my sheep know my voice. Do you know the Father's voice this morning? Huh? Because there's two voices in your life, yours and his. Well, three, actually, and then devil. He is my shepherd. And the next verse, it says this. Let's break it down. He says, I lack what? In other words, David was saying, you know what? Even though I'm in this place right now, I lack nothing. I, I'm, I'm. In other words, he was saying, God, though, though, though I'm in this, this moment, in this place of my life, you know what, God? I, I still lack nothing. I mean, let me ask you something. This is where you really start asking yourself if you really like nothing. 
If your company were to come to you on Monday morning and say, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to let you go. Would you have the kind of faith in the Lord is my shepherd that you can respond with, okay, why? Because I lack for nothing. Because I'm content with him. The God who got me this job is the God who's going to get me the next job. Or some of you, maybe you're at a place where you, 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 you have this expectation of promotion, but then they come and they say to you, you know what, actually so-and-so is a little bit more qualified. They're just a little bit better at what, what, what you want, and, and so we're going to choose that person. Can you come back with that spirit of, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack for nothing. You see, that's, that's the spirit you have or not. That's what I'm talking about today. No longer will you read Psalm 23 the same. You got to come back and say, dang, do I have that spirit of I lack nothing? Come on, when you're losing your job, when you're losing your home, when you're losing your kids, can you say, but I lack for nothing? That's not easy to say. But that takes someone who understands and who knows their shepherd, the good shepherd. And he says, I lack for nothing. I'm content. I'm content. And so... Once again, if you're not careful, you start feeling like I'll be content in my job. I'll be content with more money. I'll be content with more house. I'll be content with more car. No, you will never be content with anything else but Christ. When you find Christ, then you find contentment. When you find Christ, then you find peace. When you find Christ, then you find joy. Yes, anybody can find happiness for a day, but not everybody can find joy for the rest of your life. Happiness is seasonal, but joy is eternal. God wants you to develop joy in your heart. Happiness is cool, but it's not forever. We need to put our faith back in the unshakable, unstoppable foundation, and his name is Jesus. Jesus, that's my foundation. Jesus, that's my contentment. Jesus, he's my hope. Jesus, he's my identity. Jesus, he's my contentment. Jesus, he's my strength. Jesus, he's, he's everything. You got to come back to that place at some point. When you're in that low place, that's what comes out. What you put in comes out. If you've been putting word, that, listen, just hearing Psalm 23 all last night, that's what you're experiencing now. What's coming out is what I put in. Right now, put in a little bit more of him. And you watch and see what comes out tomorrow. Jesus, Jesus. If you have Jesus, you lack nothing. Paul said it this way, Philippians 4, 11, 13. He says this, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned. Everybody say, I have learned. Because we can all learn how to be content in Christ. It's all a, a learning curve. You have to come to the place of, I'm going to be God's student. He says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. To be what? Content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. In other words, I know how to be poor. I know how to lack, but I also know how to abound. It's not just like, like your, your lack is temporary, but your abundance is just going to be an overflow, right? So he knows I know how to live both. And he says, and I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. He says everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and I have learned to be hungry. And this isn't like spiritual, I'm, I have no food. No, this is, I ha I'm hungry. There is no food. But I've learned at any state, he says, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. How can you do it? Through Christ Jesus. We got to get the spirit of faith back in our life. Amen. He says, man, though, though I have Everything falling apart, I'm content in one, and his name is Christ. And you know what the people would do to him? The Romans would say to him, you know what? Then we're going to throw you in jail. You're going to be in jail for the rest of your life. And you know what Paul would say? Okay, fine. Then I'll just win all the jailers to Jesus Christ. And they said, okay. And after he would lead jailers to Jesus, they said, we're going to give you a beat down. Oh, you're going to stop preaching this gospel. He said, Okay. But it will all be for the suffering and the glory of my Lord and Savior Jesus. Come on, we don't know persecution. But Paul is content. He says, I'll do it. Man, it will be for the glory. Every He said, I got, I got whipped 39 stripes minus one. 
And he said, and it was all for the glory. Come on, are you willing to take one for the team? Huh? Are you willing to come to the place of just submission and just say, you know, Lord, though I may be persecuted, even, maybe it's even your own family, people you, you love, people that are close to you, are you willing to suffer just a little bit all for the glory of the Lord? Are you able to get a perspective, a God perspective, say, you know, God, okay, uh, you know what, I, I'll just take this because I'm going to make something out of this. I'm not going to let it kill me. I'm not going to let it destroy me. I'm going to let it build me. I'm going to put my faith. I'm actually going to exercise my faith now and say, you know what? No matter what I feel, no matter what I'm going through, Christ is my rock. That's the place we need to get. Are you guys here today? Come on. Paul was unstoppable, guys. Paul was unshakable. Every time they told Paul something, he said, man, I'll do it. And they said, we're going to kill you then. He said, okay, and that's where that verse comes in. He says, okay, well, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. That's not easy to say, huh? You see, when, when you're finally living up for Christ, you're going to put yourself in risky situations. You know, right now as we're preparing to combat child human trafficking now. Of course, we have a school now, but we're going to get into the human trafficking of rescuing of children globally, starting in Mexico. That's dangerous, guys. It's not like, yeah, we're, we're rescuing kids. No, that, that's dangerous. You're getting in between the cartel's business. It's a $150 billion business per year. Human trafficking. And now God calls people out. And he says, this is the anointing I'm placing in your life. Now go rescue. Whatever we do here as a church, guess what? You're all doing it. The only difference, you're safe here. <laughs> So you're good, don't worry. But let me tell you something. Don't you think it's crossed my mind like, okay, Mauricio, you're putting yourself in some pretty heavy stuff every time you go and you start getting into this. But to live is Christ and to die is gain. You got to get to that place. That's what Paul was. He, man, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I will not lack. I'm not going to lack nothing. No more. Are, are, are you guys listening, please? No more. Because if not, you'll never take your walk seriously for God. You, you'll just patty cake Christianity. God, God say no. Enough with the patty cake. Let's do this thing. Come on. Don't you ever want to find out why you were born on this earth? Don't you ever want to find out what your divine purpose is beyond making a paycheck, a salary? I love that. Do that. And get the big house, get the big car, and buy me a motorcycle while you're at it. Whatever you want. I don't care. But, 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 but. But don't you want to find out what God has for you at some point? Huh? It's going to be funny when they start calling the reward ceremony in heaven and they start talking about how, and this person, you know, John Do Juan, he won, you know, 50 people to Christ in his 80 years of life. And, and then they call your name. Okay, we have, uh, yeah. Yeah, we have, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, good Christian, yay. What? Where was the sacrifice? Where was the persecution? Where was the suffering? Where was the generosity? Where in your heavenly bank account does it have written amounts or giftings or talents that say Jesus? Content. I'm content. <laughs> you know, it's funny because as I read the verse, I'm like, man, I wonder what David looked like. So I found a picture of David of what he looked like when he was in the woods. Ready? Go get him. <laughs> there we go. Oh, my God. Help us. I think that's because think about it. I mean, I bet he was just happy with, with the Lord as my shepherd. I... I will not like, and for some of you conservative people, you probably look like this. Check this out. Next sheep. Here you go. Let's go. Boom. Huh? I, I really, I, I'm just, I mean, think about it. He had to have been just like the Lord is my shepherd. I, 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 I don't lack. I love it. You can leave that up for a little bit just to smile for a little bit. Okay, ready? Uh, verse 2, quickly. He says, read this with me. Ready? One, two, three. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. Sorry, I told him not to put it up. He may, everybody say, he makes me. You could put the verse up now. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Okay, let, let me tell you about this. So be very careful because you're either going to obey God or disobey God. He says, if you don't lay down, I'll make you. What does that mean? It means that, that you can be building your kingdom and not building his kingdom. And, and, and listen, and, and busy doesn't mean that you're making an impact. Uh, perfect per person to, to talk about was, and, and this, uh, I can, I've always been a workaholic. I can work. And so through the years as I'm getting older, I'm learning to pace myself. I at least get one day off a week. That's for sure. I get one day off a week. Um, and that's good because before I'd work sometimes seven days. But I've learned throughout the years. But there was a man, you guys remember Tommy Barnett when he, the, the founder of Dream Center. You guys ever heard of Dream Center? They rescue prostitutes, gangbangers, pimps, drug addicts, alcohol, you name it. They just do a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, community outreach. But I remember uh, a moment when they were struggling where the Dream Center was going to shut its doors because they had no money. They just ran out. And I remember Tommy Barnett sharing his story, and he said, um, this is after his, his victory. Uh, but um, he was working seven days a week, and he was working so hard to keep the ministry afloat. And... He was working seven days preaching from place, blah, blah, just ever, just raising money, raising money, raising money, raising money. Ra I mean, it takes money, guys, to win people to Christ, okay? It takes money to reach people, you know? I don't know where people think it doesn't cost anything to do this. It takes money to reach your city, your community. Well, he worked himself so hard that he ended up in the hospital. And the doctor said to him, Tommy, if, if you don't lay down, you're going to die. And Tommy was like, but if I don't do this, this ministry is going down. If I don't go out and, and speak, if I don't go out and do the things that we have to do, we're not going to be able to help anybody out. Well, he was too exhausted, sick, and broken that he had to stay in bed for three months. Three months. But here was the awesome part of the story. In the three months that he was out, more money came in ever in the history of the Dream Center in three months without him. When he says, and he makes me lie down in green pastures, it's not that God's going to whack you. But how many know that sometimes God will rest you because he wants to save you? And I believe that the whole emphasis of the story of Tommy Barnett was this. He thought he was the savior of Dream Center and not the shepherd even as pastors and as leaders let me talk to you now mom dad stop trying to be your child's savior you're not stop trying to save your child you're not their savior they also have a shepherd and his name is jesus some of us we're just we're overworking we're trying to keep the business afloat and you're restless you're tired and it's not growing and listen let me tell you something i'm learning right now in this season mauricio rest because I don't want him to, I don't want him to, I don't want to make him lay me down in green pastures. I want us to maybe be like, okay, I'll lay down. Right? I'm telling you right now, there's something when you're in the war, when you're in the battle, man, all kinds of stuff. But you have to remember the scripture says, and every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So you might as well do it willingly and not do it forcibly. Come on, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to, how to pause. I'm going to learn how to rest. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to stop worrying, how to stop being stressed. I mean, listen, here's the reality. If the Lord is your shepherd, then let him be the shepherd and let him guide you. Let him lead you. I'm not saying don't do nothing. Some of us are doing nothing at all. We need to get up. But other of us, we try to do everything. And guess what? Tell me how that's working for you because it hasn't worked for me. Great story, isn't it? When you go to rest, God goes to work. When you go to rest, God goes to work. Look at this. Um, I want you to go real quickly to uh, 
the next, the next verse. And, and, and while we go there, I want you to know this. When, when I think about the storms of, of the disciples, like for example, the, the disciples are on this boat and the storm hits, the waves are high. And just like a lot of us, we get this way too. They, they know that Jesus is in the stern and Jesus was sleeping on a pillow, the Bible says. And they're in the middle of a storm. And you know what they did? Just like us, human nature, they go down to the stern. They're like, we're dying, we're dying. Don't you care about us? Oh, my God, we're dying. You know, it's like all of us, right? It's like when we don't get what we want, we're like, God, God forgot. No, listen, <laughs> you know what the issue is? Is that peace is not the absence of a storm. It's just the ability to rest through the storm. That's all that is. What Jesus was saying to them was like, hey, listen, we can be in the storm and we can rest inside the storm. But it's only going through the storm. We're not going to stay in the storm. So he was teaching them to learn how to rest in the middle of the storm. Sometimes we're trying to figure out the storm. We're trying to stop the storm. And I get it. We can stop storms. But God's saying, no, there's also a time where you need to learn how to rest in the storm and just know that I am God. Amen? That's what he wants. And so uh, Jesus was saying, hey, there's a hiding place, and it's called the stern. Well, for us, there's a hiding place. It's called his presence. Get in his presence. Hide in Jesus. Grab a pillow at home if you want to do something tangibly and be like, Lord, this pillow represents you. I rest in you. And go take a nap. Amen? Hey, as a matter of fact, after this service, go home, take a nap. And just say, Lord, I rest in this storm. Amen? Yeah. Woo. Can't listen. You can't listen. You can't rest. You can't rest in drugs. People run to drugs. Why? They want to numb themselves. Guess what? That's temporary. When you rest in him, that's a long time. Right? You can't rest in alcohol. You can't rest in pills. Stop trying to rest in counselors and therapists. I believe in them. Trust me. I've been to them. But they ain't my rest. They're not my peace. Jesus is my rest. Jesus is my peace. Jesus is my savior. He saves me. He saves you. Amen? So you can't find it in pills. You can't find it in people. I find it in almighty God. That's my rest. That's my rest. Verse 3, quickly, we got to get out of here. It's already 31. Help us. Jesus, can I, go just, can I just go just a little bit over today? Man, I was out sick last week, so I'm back. <laughs> and I did that on purpose. I could have came to preach, but I told myself, no, Modi, so you're going to rest. Because I was worried about you all. I'm like, and of course, we got great people here. I'm going to go preach. I'm like, no, I'm just going to go rest. And I stayed home and I rested. But look at this, verse 3. He says, he refreshes. Everybody say refreshes. And the original translation says he restores. Everybody say restores. He restores my soul. You know why he said that? Because in his soul he committed adultery, adultery, murder. Think about all the things he committed in his life. And he said, and the only one that can restore me is him. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right, what? Paths for his what? Let me tell you something. The only reason God wants to restore you, it's because of his namesake. In other words, God says, if you're my son, if you're my daughter, our family, man, we're going to win in life. And because of my name, I'm going to restore you. And I'm going to put you back on the right path again. Because that is God's greatest desire. You know what? While David was running from the palace, God was saying, I'm restoring you back to the palace again. Some of us have been running from our palace, and God's saying, you're coming back. You're coming back. I'm restoring you. And restoration simply means this. Look at my definition for restoration. Restoration means I can live with myself again. Because some of you, you've, you've, you've had so much shame, you have so much guilt, you've beat yourself down so much that you can't even live with yourself. Well, guess what? When God restores, you can live with you again. You can be comfortable with you again. You can stop having self-hatred and you can start learning how to love yourself because Jesus loves you regardless of where you've been. All he cares about is where you're going. He restores my soul and he puts me right back on the paths of righteousness. Aren't you glad that God can make crooked straight? Huh? Any crooks in the house? Huh? Anybody? Don't lift your hand, please. <laughs> say it with me. Say it with me. Put your hand on your heart. Say, restore me, Lord. Say it. Lead me. Guide me. Amen. Last one, and we'll get out of here. Last one. 
Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Listen, what he was basically saying was, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. David had the, the, finally had the revelation, you know what, I've lived in fear too long, but I realize that I'm running from shadows. Let's look at this picture of a shadow. Look at this. Many times this is what it looks like. It looks like this. And we're like, ah. But you know what? Right behind that big old hand is just a little hand playing on the wall. That's what Satan does with all of us. He's, listen, can you imagine when we get to heaven and, and you see almighty God? And then, and, and, and Jesus is talking to Satan. And you're like, what the heck is he on? Who's he talking to? And it's going to be like this little, little thingy, mousy thingy. And all along, all those years, you were afraid of that? Why? Because David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil. It was always a shadow. It was always a shadow. So think, think about it. You'll never risk anything for, in life because a shadow always overshadows you. Enough. Enough. Look at your neighbor and say, no more shadows, ma'am. And if it's a lady, say, ma'am. Come on, stop it. Say it with me, I'm not afraid of sickness. Say it, I'm not afraid to die. Say it, I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid of my future. I'm not afraid of lack. Come on, stop being afraid that you're not going to have enough money to live the rest of your life. That's a shadow. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of sickness, not only in my life, I'm not afraid of sickness on my child's life. Stephen, I spoke this over your wife this morning. You're not afraid. That's a shadow over your little girl. Hell no. We speak life to Sarah. Sarah was the first baby of Elevate Church. Can you all believe that? She's exactly, gosh, eight, eight years old. She was the first infant we had in our nursery. The first one born, the first one we ever had in this building. And so we declare her whole and healed. And though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil, my friend. Amen. Because why? Because the Lord is with me. Who's with you? The Lord is with me. Who's with you? The Lord is with me. Come on. He is the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not lack. You're not going to lack peace. You're not going to lack joy. You're not going to lack finances. You're not. Just get the revelation of who's Lord and who's king of your life and you watch God do the rest. Stop trying to work and perform and let God do what he does best. Amen? Come on, your best days are ahead. Can you believe for that? Huh? Yes or no? I'm not afraid of success. I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Huh? Though the enemy come in one way, he's going to run seven ways. I'm not running anymore. He's going to take flight. I'm not taking flight no more. I'm standing ground, and I will fight the good fight of faith. Come on. This is where the church rises. This is where we take the anointing, the calling, the purpose, the plan of God inside of me. And you say, now, God, do what you do best in me. Amen. I'm just going to go rest and grab my little Holy Ghost pillow, lay down, and just let you do this thing. Amen. Yeah. Last verse, what the heck? Verse 5. Close your Bibles. Let's get out of here. Pack it up real quick. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I love that one. Listen. Stop tripping over your enemy. <laughs> Stop promoting your enemy. Stop, stop advertising your enemy. Stop marketing your enemy. And start feasting in the presence of your enemy. He says, I set up a table. My favorite restaurant for my birthday wishes, okay, <laughs> is Roos Chris or Fogo de Chao. Roos Chris, oh man, when they set that table up, and they got two people ready right there, man. If your drink even goes down 30%, brand new Coke. They're, they're, they're just like, boom. 
five star, five, cl- I mean, it's just fine dining, you name it, just boom, everything. That's what God's saying. He says, man, I'm setting a table for you in the face of your enemies. When your enemies are rising, when people are talking crap about you, when people are trying to hurt you, now mind you, people are not your enemy. It just so happens that the enemy uses people to get to you. So know your enemy. Your enemy is Satan, not your spouse. Your enemy is Satan, not your boss. Your enemy is Satan, not your kids. Your enemy is Satan, not your church. And he says, and I set a table for you in the presence of your enemy and divine favor will follow you all the days of your life. God will favor you in the presence of your enemy. Isn't that good stuff? If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.